Good evening to those of you that are watching online, and good morning to those of you that are here in person. A uh, beautiful day the Lord has given us today, and uh, we are going to celebrate the beauty of today, and we're going to spend some time in God's Word as well. Just before we began uh, taping uh, today's Bible study, we shared prayer requests here in person, and I'm sure you may have some at home as well. We want to go to the Lord in prayer together. Would you join me? Father God, we thank you that uh, we can come to you knowing that you're already aware of all of our needs. Um, God, even as our Bible study today is going to remind us, you are a gracious and compassionate God, and you care for us and you care for our concerns. You, dear Heavenly Father, take those concerns and make them personally yours, and we thank you for that. And so all that has been... Um, Mentioned this morning, we just place them all in your hands. We place their families in your hands. We ask God for, for peace, for wisdom, and discernment, dear Heavenly Father, both by the, those individuals and by medical teams that are, that are working with them, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you also that uh, you are there working very actively in each of those situations. God, we thank you for your word. We ask now that uh, you open our hearts and our minds um, to all that you would have to say to us. Speak to us individually. Speak to us very clearly this morning, God. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm Jerry Woolley. I am one of the associate pastors here. Our pastor has been at uh, the Tennessee Baptist Convention down in Chattanooga for the last couple of days. He is on his way home. In fact, by the time you watch this tonight, he will uh, not only be home, but he will be back as a part of the service that we have here on Wednesday night. Let me go ahead and say now so I don't forget it, because next week is Thanksgiving, we will not have a pastor's Bible study. We typically uh, do not meet on the Wednesday night right before Thanksgiving, or if a Wednesday night is right before Christmas or something, we do not meet during those times. Uh, many of you know that here on Wednesday nights, there's anywhere between 1,000, 1,500 people, sometimes more, on campus, and most of those are uh, preschoolers, children, and teenagers, and it takes a lot of volunteers to make that ministry happen. And many of those volunteers are parents and grandparents uh, that will be getting ready for Thanksgiving themselves, and so it just makes it very difficult to try to pull off a Wednesday night uh, when uh, the whole volunteer force is not able to be here. So we will not be having the pastor's Bible study uh, next Wednesday as well. Most other activities that take place during the day uh, will take place. We, the office will be open. Everything will be going on uh, next week except for the Wednesday evening services and uh, the Wednesday morning taping of the pastor's Bible study. That will not happen. And then on Thanksgiving Day, uh, the offices will be closed that day. And then we'll be right back at our normal pace right after that, getting ready for Christmas. Uh, those of you that are watching online, you can only see a small part of the stage this morning. But those of you that are in person, you see the stage has grown. It's much, much bigger than it used to be. Uh, they're getting ready for Christmas in the Ville that will take place here in uh, just a few days. And they're... Um, rehearsing and getting prepared for that and kind of reconfiguring the stage to make that happen as well. So we're going to be in Psalm 112, and as you're finding that, I want to ask you uh, to think of someone that you know, maybe someone that's in your life presently or someone that was in your life at some time in the past, who when you looked at them, you just saw a person of perfect peace. Maybe they had many things go on in their life that you would look at them and you'd think, I would just be, you know, I, I would fall apart if I had that going on in my life. And yet they are facing it with such peace. Maybe the person you're thinking of is a person that never really had much in monetary ways, but they seem to just be blessed in such amazing ways spiritually. And as a result, they blessed others. They left a legacy of blessing, uh, even though financially they might not have had much. Well, in Psalm 112, we get a picture of what those who fear the Lord, what those who are disciples uh, should look like. We get a picture of that. Last week we studied Psalm 111, and I, I taught through that one as well. And I told you that even though we do not know who wrote Psalm 111 or Psalm 112, uh, many Bible scholars speculate that it could have been David, uh, David wrote so many that we attribute to him, but we know there's other psalms without, any, uh, uh, without being attributed to anybody that 
people think many of those may have been written by David as well. And this is one of those. Psalm 111 and Psalm 12 certainly were written by the same person. We see the same style. Both of them have uh, 10 verses. Both of them have three sections. Both of them are uh, alphabetically written or they are written in such a way that uh, the first word of each line of the poems, uh, they're acrostics. They follow the Hebrew alphabet. And so uh, in our translation, English translation, while we only have 10 verses, in the original, there would have basically been 11 uh, sentences or 11 verses and uh, consisting of 22 lines. And each of those 22 lines would start with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so both 111 and 112 follow that. Uh, their wording is so similar that obviously the same person most, must have written both and possibly wrote them to be bookends, to be used simultaneously. Where 111 talks all about praising of God and our need to praise the Lord for the works of his hands. And we looked last week at the, the characteristics of God that are mentioned in 111. Today we're going to look at the characteristics or um, the 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 commonalities of one who is a disciple, one who is uh, a follower of God that has fear of the Lord in them. And we noticed that last week, verse 10 in 111 ends with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. And I told you at the end of last week, let's skip on down and look at the first verse of 112, which starts out, happy is the man who fears the Lord. So there's obviously a bridge between 111 and 112, and the idea of fear of the Lord is that bridge. We talked last week about this idea of fear is not the terror or uh, the, the being afraid of some consequences that's going to take place. The fear that's mentioned here is the idea of awe, of being reverent before the Lord, of honoring the Lord, of respecting the Lord, of acknowledging the Lord's power and the Lord's greatness. And we live with that uh, knowledge, uh, that acknowledgement of who the Lord is in our life, and, it, and we allow it to impact every aspect of our life. That, that awe of God, that reverence towards God impacts everything in the disciple's life. And so from the end of chapter 111 to the beginning of chapter 112, we have this bridge that deals with fear of the Lord, honoring the Lord. Last week, we were told, honor the Lord because of his greatness and the work of his hands. Today, we're going to see where those who fear the Lord, what is going to be the consequences of fearing the Lord? What is going to be the consequences of obeying his word and studying his word? If you remember last week up in verse 2, the writer told us that the person that acknowledges the Lord's great work studies it. They make that a study. They make that part of their life is to observe the Lord's great, great work and make that part of, of, of who they are. Well, today we're going to see the results of studying the magnificent works of of the Lord and what it does in the life of the believer, the life of the person who's obedient. So let's jump into chapter 112. It starts off with the same word that started off 111, hallelujah, and which is praise the Lord or praise God. And so the writer wants to acknowledge right up front before the writer goes any further into the text that the writer personally acknowledges God, praising God, praising him for all he has done. It starts off, hallelujah, happy is the man who fears the Lord, taking great delight in his commandments. I told you that it's kind of divided out into three sections. And the first section here, we're just going to call the character of a God-centered life or a godly-centered life. And that character is happiness, one who is happy in the fear of the Lord, one who takes delight in his commandments. Think back. Uh, I started to say uh, as when you were a child, but the truth of it is we never outgrow having to follow commandments of someone else, whether it's traffic laws or, or, or something else. There's always someone that's trying to tell us what to do, no matter how old we are. We never get beyond that. And uh, so think to a time when um, 
you had a commandment, you had a law, you had something that was given to you or told to you that was for your own good, but you really didn't want to follow that. Stubbornness, self-will, call it what you want to call, call it, but you, you didn't want to follow this word of advice, this law that was put there for your own good. You had a choice. And we all have a choice. And it's the same with God's precepts or God's commandments. We can choose to follow them grudgingly or we can choose to follow them with great joy. And the writer of Psalm 112 says, Happy is the person, happy is the man or woman who delights in the commands of the Lord. The only way you can delight in a law or a command is when you see the benefit of it. You realize that by following this rule by following this precept I'm going to be better off for doing that my life is going to be improved by doing that and so it says here that the person who truly delights in God's commandment is a happy person they're not following grudgingly they could did you ever follow the teacher or your parent you did what they said but you did it very grudgingly and, and it was always worse than if you had just put a smile on your face and gone ahead and done it, right? But you have that choice, and we have that choice with God's commands. Are you going to follow them grudgingly? Or are you going to follow them joyfully? And part of the consequences of, joy, of following them joyfully is the fact that you will uh, be happy, that there will be happiness that is there. Now, does that mean that you just have this kind of overwhelming uh, bubbly happiness constantly and no I don't think it necessarily means that but it means that there is this this peace about you that is just a happy disposition when people look at you they see you as a person who uh, is happy and a person that is finding joy in life and and we can do that when we follow the Lord's commands and know that it's for our good so the first section is the character of a God-centered life we're happy. We rejoice in his commands. The second section is verses 2 through 9, and we're going to call that the consequences of a God-centered life. If happiness is the main character of a person that has centered their life on God, then, then what are the consequences? What comes with that? And I'll be the first to say there's some passages in these next few verses that are a little difficult, a little hard to understand. They're, they're talking about things that, that, such as the person will have wealth. And I think we all know people that do not seem to have a penny to their name, and yet they seem to be very happy. They seem to be very blessed. They have wealth in other ways. I had a friend one time, an older lady, that um, had nothing. She lived in a little tiny house that was about 700 square feet. She, uh, money-wise, she, she had money to buy food and, and to pay her bills, but she didn't have money to do anything else. She, she lived very frugally. And I told her one day, I said, you are the richest person I know. And she looked at me and she said, oh, Jerry, you know I'm not rich. Somewhere in my youthful wisdom, which I didn't have much of, but at that moment I seemed to have a little bit of youthful wisdom, and I said, there's a whole lot more to being rich than just a bank account. There's a whole lot more to being rich that has to do with God's blessings than just financial richness. And I talked to her about how her three children, who at that point were all adults and had children themselves, I said, look, look at how your three children have, have grown up and, and prospered in life. Again, maybe not prospered financially, but... They, they prospered in every other way in life, and, and her grandchildren. And I just kind of went through step by step the things that I knew about her and her family, and I said, I would call that rich. And so we look at this passage, and it seems to indicate that if you, um, if you obey the Lord's command, there is going to be a richness that comes from it. And I don't want us to get caught off guard and start thinking in financial terms. I think it'd be better to interpret it in spiritual terms. What ways has God blessed us and given us riches that are spiritual riches? So let's start with verse 2. It says, his descendants, now remember this is the man who's happy because he fears the Lord. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. 
Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Let's stop right there just a second. And, and, uh, and the translation I'm reading out of, which is Holman Christian Standard, it seems to indicate descendants as in to those that were uh, through childbirth, the descendants that come through that family lineage. But several translations, and you may be reading out of one of them, talks more about your spiritual lineage those that you have impacted and influenced through your faith, those who have come to faith themselves because of your influence, those children in the faith that we have. And it says that they will be powerful in the land. The New King James Version says they will be mighty. They will be mighty in the land. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will be powerful as in an elected position or something like that but to be mighty in the land or to be powerful in that sense means that they too will be people of great influence other people will look to them uh, to uh, be kind of the decision maker or their guide they will see in them uh, a power that comes from a source far beyond their own and, and of course we know that source is, is God that he is blessing the individual with that powerful knowledge, but he is also, because of them and their influence, other generations are being influenced and they themselves become upright or they become blessed through the righteousness of that individual. We have to ask ourselves, who are we influencing? Who in our life are we influencing? And the true answer to that is far more people than any of us know. We're influencing a whole lot of people that we're not even aware we're influencing. Neighbors, friends, coworkers, family members that maybe uh, we, we don't think we have any influence with at all, and, and yet we may be influencing them in many, many ways. And we have to ask ourselves, am I influencing them spiritually? Am I living a life of righteousness and holiness that through my life other people are being influenced to also live a life uh, of awe and reverence towards the Lord. It goes on, it says, Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. The fact that the second phrase there, his righteousness endures forever, is what leads me to believe this wealth and riches that's talking about here is not necessarily financial wealth and riches as much as it's the spiritual wealth and riches. That characteristic. Last week we we looked at and listed a multitude of God's characteristics that are found in verses 2 through 9. Today in verses 2 through 9 of chapter 112, we're going to see those characteristics that become the characteristics of a person who is living that godly life, the person who is living a God-centered life. And, and part of that is just this over, overwhelming abundance of generosity to other people and a, a wealth of spiritual riches that come to us. You know, it's, it's interesting in here that it talks about fear, and we have talked about that that's a, an awe or a reverence to the Lord, but it's fixing to change here in a moment to fear that is what we more commonly think of as the definition of fear. But before we get to that in verse 6, we are finding out in verses 2 through 5 that that person that honors the Lord, there is a richness about them that blesses other people. And then verse 4 says, that person, they have a light that shines in darkness. The scripture actually says, light shines in the darkness for the upright. It basically can mean two things. It can mean that the, the person living a God-centered life, they their life is illuminated and lit in such a way that they are able to see circumstances around them as other people cannot see. That they, they have a, a vision that is illuminated by that light that allows them to see, but it also can refer to the fact that a person with a God-centered life, they themselves are a light in the midst of darkness. They themselves are a shining beacon for the world around them. That is part of the influence that they have on other people is that light that is there, that in the midst of darkness, there is a light that shines. They become a light that draws others and leads others to God themselves. He goes on and he says the, the consequences is that he becomes gracious and compassionate and righteous person becomes gracious, compassionate, righteous. I'm still working on those. 
I don't know about you, but I, I, will, uh, I was telling my Connect group this past Sunday morning, uh, graciousness, compassionate, and righteousness are something that I will be working on all the days of my life. And I think that's true for a lot of us. But because God is gracious, compassionate, and righteous, if we have made him the center of our life, a natural result, a natural consequence is that we become that way as well. He goes on, he says, goodwill. Uh, good will come to the man who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. That godly person, God-centered person, is going to be a person that sees needs to, of other people and tries to help those, whether it's a, a financial need or some other kind of need that is there. Some of you have probably known someone in your life that, again, maybe didn't seem to have all that much financially, but you never stopped at their home that they didn't give you a meal that you never stopped at their home, that they didn't send you home with something, whether it was a, a bag of cookies or a slice of cake that they had just baked or, or they were there to help when you needed help with your own home or you needed help with your automobile or something. That, that person who seemed to have, did not seem to have much themselves were the first person there to jump in and to help and to be generous towards you. The psalmist says that is the consequence of fearing the Lord. That is consequence of honoring the Lord, having reverence for the Lord is we will be that person that is gracious, compassionate, righteous, and the first person to help others, the first person to jump in and help take care of the needs of others. We're moving in chapter, uh, to verse 6, and, and it changes direction just a little bit. It goes from what the righteous or the God-centered person will be to others around them to what the God-centered person will be to themselves, in a sense. What, what the consequences in their own life will be of being a God-centered person. Verse 6 says, He will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. His heart is assured. He will not fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. Scripture talks a lot about fear. And typically we are told what? Do not fear. Do not fear. And in this passage, the psalm is saying that when that moment comes that should make you fear, and this time we're not talking about the fear of the Lord as in being in awe or reverent to the Lord. This time we're talking about fear that comes from, uh, from danger, from the danger that could possibly happen. I wrote a definition found this definition of fear, and it says, an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. The psalmist is saying that's very real for all of us. None of us are going to get out of this life without some point feeling a sense of danger or threat from something around us, a situation or a person around us that we, we feel that threat from. But what he's saying here is that even though that threat is real and the, the cause of fear could be real, the person that is God-centered, they will be so steadfast. And because they are so centered in God, the fear does not impact their life. They're able, in a sense, to shake it off. They're able to, to stand and face the fear knowing that God is in control, that God has got this. You know, occasionally when I'm making hospital visits, I run into somebody, and that's their attitude. God has got this. And they may have just heard devastating news from their doctor, and yet they are able to look and say, but I'm not, I have no fear. God has got this. That is a picture of a God-centered life. Most of us are working on that. There are some people that got that already. And they can look at that fear and know that the Lord is going to give them the ability to look it in the face and do what needs to be done to continue on with life. Because their fear, the fear of, of this unknown threat, is replaced by fear, awe of God. Fear is replaced by fear when we're God-centered. We replace the bad fear with the good fear of knowing that, that God has got this. He goes on and he says he will not fear bad news in verse 7 because his heart is confident he is trusting in the Lord. 
He's trusting in the Lord no matter what may come. And you know, if you are like most of us and you get fixated with the news, it is so easy to look at today's news and just have fear well up in us. If it's not from a threat to us personally, it is maybe a threat to our way of life or a threat to our nation or a threat to, to people we love and care for around the world and we see what is going on and it's so easy to allow fear to overtake our common sense at that point and we become so wrapped up in that. And the psalmist says, we don't have to be wrapped up in that because our heart is confident. You know, the, the good thing for us that those who originally heard this psalm didn't have is we have this. We have the whole story. We have the story of how it ends. We know that in the end, God is the victor. Jesus Christ is the victor. But for those that would have heard this back at the time that it was written, they didn't have the end of the story. And it would have been so easy for them to be wrapped up in fear of what was taking place in their own personal life. The threat maybe of other nations, the threat of lack of finances, the threat of losing a job, the threat of, of, of family uh, relationships and, and different things going on. It would have been so easy. And the psalmist says, but once you have put your confidence in the Lord, you can be steadfast in the midst of it. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Doesn't mean it's not going to affect you. It just means that you can be steadfast and look that fear in the face and know that God has got this. It tells us at the end of verse 8, in the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. Who is he? He is that man or woman who has put their faith in God, that God-centered individual. They can look their foe in the face and have triumph knowing that God wins in the end. Verse 9, which is the last verse of the second section, the consequences of a God-centered life, says, He distributes freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted. It seems to kind of switch back to those first few verses of how being a person that lives in reverence and awe of the Lord, how they impact others how that fear of the Lord impacts others. And verse 9 says that, once again, as, as mentioned earlier, the person is generous. They, they give free, freely to those in need. They have a righteousness that endures forever no matter what they face. The righteousness that they have, that holiness that they have, that relationship that they have with God gets them through, and it will endure forever. And then there's this interesting terminology here. His horn will be exalted in honor. What in the world does that mean? So I went back and looked, and in the back of, of my uh, Bible, there are certain words that are defined for us, and one of them is the word horn. It says a symbol of power based on the strength of an animal's horn. The idea that that animal's antlers or horn is, is a symbolic way of talking about the strength of that particular animal, and we are told here that that God-centered person, they will have strength that is symbolized by that horn, and it is strength that will be exalted and honored by God and by those around us. Others will recognize our strength, and they will begin to lean on us. When they are in need of strength themselves, they will begin to lean on our strength to get them through it. And also, they will um, realize that God is honoring the God-centered person for the strength that they have. They're being honored. Then we come to the third section, which is that last verse. And we're going to title this one, Contrast with a God-Centered Life. So we have the character of a God-Centered Life, section 2, the consequences of a God-Centered Life. Section 3, the contrast with a God-Centered Life. And it changes direction here. And instead of talking about the God-Centered individual and how their life will be impacted personally or how they will impact the lives of others, we are switching to the person that is just the opposite of a God-centered individual. And in my translation here, the word is the wicked man, the person that does not have reverence for God, the person that does not put their trust in God, the person who maybe, maybe they follow the Lord's commands, but they're doing it grudgingly instead of joyfully. 
as it says right up front. This, this person that doesn't give God center place in their life, and it says the wicked man will see it, what? The wicked man will see the blessings of the God-centered individual and will be angry because of it. He will gnash his teeth in despair. The desire of the wicked will come to nothing. Basically, our life is lived in such a way that the wicked person sees it and, and, and becomes angry about it. Why is that person blessed when I'm not? Why is that person seem to be honored? I'm the one that should be honored. Why are they being honored? We, be, we begin to make these judgments on a person's relationship to the world around us, and we're not seeing that it's because of God's blessing. And so we become jealous. We become angry. It says he gnashes his teeth in despair. I use the word we become jealous at that point in time. And his life will come to nothing. I went back through verses 2 through 9 and made a list of some of the consequences that are spelled out for us. First is the God-centered person will leave a spiritual legacy. They will leave a legacy to others of their faith. That they will become a person of influence. That doesn't necessarily mean they are the person that is the leader, but they are a person of influence to those around them and those that are watching them. They will be favored by God's blessings. The God-centered person will find favor in God's blessings. They will become a spiritual light to the world around them, but they will also see the world around them with a spiritual light. They will see it differently than the world sees it. They will be gracious, compassionate, righteous. They will lend freely. They will be deeply rooted in God and in his word. They will not be shaken. They will be steadfast. They will care for others and show that concern freely. They'll be honored by God. Looks to me when you read this that uh, the advantages of making God the center of our life far outweighs any disadvantages. And the disadvantages basically are not listed. They're just not there because according to this psalmist, there are no disadvantages to living a life that, I mean, there are no disadvantages to living a life that is God-centered. It's all advantages, both for the individual and for the person they influence. So we have to come to, as the pastor says, what is the so what? And basically, I've written down three questions that I believe are the so what of this passage. The first one is, what or who have I centered my life on? Who is the center of my life? What is the center of my life? we're not careful, we will make someone else or something else the center over God. It happens so quickly, so innocently that we're not even aware that we have placed someone or something else in the position of being the center of our life. So who or what is the center of my life? The second question is, do I desire to study and live the Scripture? Do I desire to study God's Word and joyfully follow God's word or um, do I joyfully desire to live by God's word? So do I desire to study and live the scripture? And then the final question is, do I focus on the character of God and strive to live a life of holiness and righteousness? Do I focus on the character of God that we found in chapter 111 last week? Do I focus on those characteristics and do I begin to live them out myself by living a life of holiness and of righteousness? Appreciate your time today, uh, whether you're here in person this morning or watching online. We so appreciate you being a part of First Baptist Church Hendersonville. This is just a great church to be a part of, isn't it? And I am so thankful we are in a church where our pastor opens God's Word and teaches it to us and challenges us to be students of God's Word and Psalm 111 and 112 both challenge us to be students, at, not only students of God's Word, but to live God's Word out. Would you join me as we pray? Father God, we thank you for your Word. May we truly be students who not only study it, but live it. We love you. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.